Hi, this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T-Touch practitioner for animals and people. And this is Tristan, who is a corgi. He's looking out the window. It's spring here. We have daffodils. Only the little tiny ones. The big ones aren't up yet. And he's a corgi. And this is another episode of Conversations with a Corgi. And today we're going to be talking about um, a subject that's really important to anyone doing T-Touch work or craniosacral therapy with animals or people. And it's something that I have studied most of my adult life. And so we may have to break this into two episodes. We'll see how far we get in one day. And that is the idea of right and left brain differentiation. Bess, have a seat. <laughs> Good boy. Um, I think I mentioned earlier in one of my talks about my work um, in physical therapy school with a wonderful guy named Dr. Wallace who worked at the University of Hartford. And many years ago, I think it was in the 50s, early 60s, there was a fellow named H.M. who had severe seizures. And so they severed the center part of his brain, the corpus callosum, to stop the seizures. And they found out that he was unable to function in the real world. So he stayed at the university. And uh, they studied him and took care of him and um, really learned a lot about the brain thanks to this man who passed away maybe 10, 15 years ago. And there are many books about HM out now since he has um, passed away and we don't have to worry about his privacy the way we used to. So my interest in the right and left brain began with my study with Dr. Wallace, who uh, was also an animal lover. And we talked a lot about the differences between human and animal brains because I was learning and developing small animal and equine craniosacral therapy at the time I was in physical therapy school and studying with Dr. Wallace, who taught a fabulous course called Brain and Behavior. And to me, I love neuroscience. So for me, seeing uh, the chemistry and the locations of the brain that create a behavior uh, was fascinating. And the names of these structures are so interesting. I just, I'll, I'll never forget them because they're named after researchers who really dedicated their lives to trying to understand the brain, which is very hard because all we have to do that with is our brain. So from an early time in my physical therapy school career, I was aware of um, right and left brain differentiation and the studies that had been going on at the very school where I was going to physical therapy school. And we, Dr. Wallace and I talked about the fact that the corpus callosum, which um, is a fibrous bundle that connects the right and left side of the brain is much less developed in animals than it is in humans. And that does not mean they are um, struggling with that in any way because they have many gifts that we don't have because we are so connected to the right and left side of our brain. And I believe I mentioned earlier, if you're teaching a horse to canter on his left lead and then you go the other direction, you have to start anew as if the horse has never learned to canter on a correct lead uh, because he can't translate that from one side of his brain to the other as humans do. So the same is true for dogs. And that's why with T-Touch, we have that great opportunity to work with horses that have been led incorrectly and abusively on the left side. And we can now uh, lead them on the right side where they have no experience being led. And we have a different connection with them and they are learning anew how to be led. The other thing is that when we're on their right side, we may be going more into our right brain to lead them on that side because it's a very different experience. If you haven't ever tried walking your dog or your horse on the opposite side, try it and notice what's going on in your brain. And so maybe we are more holistic and creative in our leading on the offside, and that allows us to connect more deeply with our horses. And so therefore, they behave very differently when we're on that offside. So some of the early research and continuing research about right and left brain was done by a fellow named Roger Sperry. And one of the people that loved his work was a woman named Betty Edwards, who wrote this wonderful book in 1979. I've had it all these years. I had a great anthropology class at U-Delaware, um, and I bought some of my favorite books, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Bernie Siegel's book, and Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Betty Edwards is a professor in California. She's retired now, and what her specialty was was teaching people how to draw and how to do art. And what this book talks about is artistic perception. 
meaning that when you look at the world as an artist, you like structurally, visually do it in a different way than a person who is maybe an accountant. And so in our American lives, we spend so much time in our left brain because we're analyzing. It's a linear society. Everything is digital. And now we're using computers all day. We're very, very left brain. And that diminishes our ability to learn to draw. So she said we need to have some exercises to bypass the left brain so that your right brain can be free to draw. For instance, one of those exercises was drawing upside down. So instead of drawing a picture of your dog standing there looking at you, you would flip him over and draw him upside down because your left brain doesn't know what to do with that and it doesn't interfere with your right brain. So if you've never tried to draw something upside down, even something simple like a vase, give it a shot. And the other thing that she said that drawing on the right side um, in, uh, requires are five special skills, which is looking at the edges of things, looking at the spaces around things, looking at the relationships between things, and looking at the relationship between light and shadow, as well as seeing the thing as a whole. And all of those five things make you engage with something in a way that your left brain is not that active. And so you're able to see things in a different way. And when I was looking at this recently, I was thinking that there's a guy named Mir Schneider who um, cured himself from lifetime of blindness by learning to look at the negative spaces and the edges. And in looking at what um, a summary of Betty Edwards' work is, I think what Mir Schneider was really doing was tapping into his right brain to improve his visual acuity as opposed to using his left brain and his logic and you know trying to do those kinds of eye exercises by looking at the world in another way, emotionally, behaviorally, physically, he was able to structurally see the world in a new way. So if you've got any interest in vision at all, you should definitely check out the work of Mir Schneider. It's M-E-I-R. Schneider and his he's got audio tapes and eye exercises and many people um, who are trained in craniosacral therapy are familiar with his work and have indeed um, made themselves so much better from doing his eye exercises that they no longer require glasses um, and his one of his theories is that as we age uh, our eyes have never fully rested and therefore that's what's uh, creating the aging process in our eyes. So he has a lot of exercises. Uh, one of them is something called palming, which is an old eye exercise where you rub your hands together and then close your eyes and cover your eyes with your hands. And you have to hold that for two minutes or more. And what that does is allow the eye muscles to rest completely. Otherwise, even sleeping in a dark room, your eye muscles are not completely rested because as you probably know, when you're having REM sleep, your eye muscles are moving. So he was effectively able to use his right brain to regain his sight. Um, and many people have learned to draw using Betty Edwards' suggestions um, in drawing on the right side of the brain. I think it's in its fourth or fifth printing now. There are workbooks that go with it and it really has um, helped people who are really stressed out and living in a linear world reconnect with the other side of their brain and find some peace out of the chatter of the left side of the brain. And then a few years ago, we had some more interesting work by a woman named Jill Bolte Taylor, who is a neuroscientist, I believe at Harvard, and she had a stroke on the left side of her brain. And during the hours, it was a massive stroke, she was a pretty young woman, during the hours, as the stroke was taking more and more of her brain function, four or five hours, she was really aware of how her right brain was in, increasing in its power, in its function in her, and her awareness and things were changing as the left brain was crashing due to the stroke. And in fact, most people who have a stroke have it on the left side of their brain. And when you think about how much we use our left brain in American life, you know, is it just worn out? Is that why we have the stroke there? Who knows? But I've worked with lots of stroke patients and very rarely do they have a stroke on the right side. And of course, as many of you probably are aware, the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and vice versa. So having a stroke on your left side means that things like holding a pencil um, are very, very difficult and then you have to do it on your non-dominant side. Uh, 
and this is often true even in people who are left-handed. They're kind of an anomaly, and I'll say more about that in a little while. And one of the things that Jill Bolte Taylor um, wrote about in her book, and there's a beautiful TED talk with her too that you can look up easily. It's Jill B O L T E Taylor Bolte, and she found that when she was living in the right side of her brain, she was experiencing a sense of well-being and calm and peacefulness and wholeness, even though she knew intellectually she was having a massive stroke and that she was going to need years to recover. And in fact, it took about eight years for her to regain the function that she has today to uh, do her talks that inspire people about uh, the information we know about the right and left brain. So her book is really interesting, and it's interesting uh, having a brain scientist describe what was happening in her brain during her stroke and as she was coming back from her stroke. Another interesting thing in my experience with right and left brain balance has been working with people who have been diagnosed with psychiatric issues, profound ones in some cases. Many, many people have reported that if they were becoming very, very depressed or very, very manic, that they have particular activities that they do to uh, help themselves not have this problem. And for instance, when people are experiencing um, mania, getting really excited and happy, if they were, you know, which progresses to a point where you're, you know, maxing out your credit cards and jumping on a plane and flying to Arizona and not knowing how to get home. So it's not a good thing. Uh, so those people have found that by writing, by just simply the process of writing, which really is your left brain, that they have been able to calm their brain down and come back into their center and uh, stop an episode of mania. I mean, who needs drugs when you have a pencil and paper? And of course, now we do everything with a keyboard, which may have a different effect. These people did report that it was writing with a pencil that made the difference. And a lot of other people found that if they did any activity that balance the right and left brain, like a bilateral activity. There's something called brain gym, where you're like marching and you're tapping one knee and then the other with your hands. Exercises like that, that unify the right and left brain, were able to pull these people out of an extreme state with their emotions if they had you know, something going on that they were feeling unmanageable with. Uh, some of the other activities people use, there's a thing called poi, where you're spinning balls on the ends of strings or chains or sometimes they're fireballs. It comes from Hawaii, it's POI, and they're doing bilateral movements like this to twirl those things around. And something like that really involves both sides of the brain. Um, it's like a baton twirler who has to do two batons. You know, you have to, your non-dominant hand, which makes it really hard to twirl a baton. And poi is similar. You've got to keep your both sides of your body balanced when you do it and not let your strong side overcome your weak side or the balls crash into each other and hit you. So activities that unify the brain seem to help people when they were going into an extreme state and they were able to bring themselves back to balance. And if this is a similar situation we have with our animals and ourselves with a sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. If the sympathetic nervous system, which is our stress, fear, flight, freeze, faint side of our body or our nervous system is becoming too aroused and we're losing the balance with the parasympathetic, which is the peaceful side, the rest digest side, sometimes doing things like T-touch, which um, does seem to connect the right and left brain, can bring that back into balance, as does craniosacral therapy, Feldenkrais, and a few other modalities. So it's really interesting to look at um, how these systems work based on the idea of looking at the right and left brain connection. Tristan. Another interesting thing is that Einstein was able to develop his theory of relativity, and he wrote about this extensively, by using his right brain. He closed his eyes and imagined himself riding a beam of light through the universe. And, I mean, I don't know how you're sitting on a beam of light, but he was able to imagine himself, you know, using his creative side, uh, riding a beam of light, and that is how he developed his theory of, of relativity, which has changed physics and our view of the world today. And, in fact, using the right side of our brain may literally change how we see the world um, in terms of what's evolving in the field of physics, string theory, and things like that. 
So, you know, part of uh, being interested in neuroscience leads you right into being interested in physics because they are really closely related. Because when you're doing something, physics, like physics for instance, it does require a lot of math skills, which is totally the left side of your brain. But to think in theoretical physics, that's the right side of your brain. And people who are doing theoretical physics, whoa, gesundheit biski, need to be able to um, really connect both the right and left brain because you need to have, oh honey, you need to have the skills of the mathematic equations to work with the theory on the right side of your brain um, to do high level physics. And this is also true with music. Music is something that is very linear when you're learning it. You know, where are the keys on the piano? How do you read the music? How do you put your fingers on your instrument to play the notes? How do you breathe? How do you stand? How is your posture? All of that stuff is linear learning. However, when you get to the point of many great jazz musicians and someone like Mozart certainly and Bach, who I love, although Bach not so much as Mozart, um, you really have to use your right brain to get that creativity involved to be able to compose amazing things, especially any kind of revolutionary music like what Laurie Anderson does. Those, uh, those musicians, and Mozart was kind of a trendsetter in a way for the way he was looking at music. Bach's music, which actually does really engage your right and left brain more than most other types of music, was really linear in its development and in, its, in the way it's written. You've got a lot of repeating phrases um, that just change a little bit and then repeat again. So it really does, I think, to listen to Bach, you can really hear this. Um, you can hear, you can hear the, the repetition of the patterns which engages your left brain, but then when you, the whole thing comes together, and there's certainly uh, specific parts in the music where you can hear this, you can really hear like the, the music, the beauty, the, the flow that evolves from those repeated patterns. Um, and Mozart doesn't use pattern as much as Bach, so it's a little interesting to compare the two of them because a lot of people point to Mozart as someone you should listen to to uh, engage your brain, but I have found, and others too, that Bach is actually better. So if you want to engage your right and left brain, try to listen to some Bach, and in fact, I listened to all of his piano music when I was writing my book because I needed to have the stories that were linear but to look at the bigger picture, I needed to engage my right brain, which um, is fairly exhausting, and listening to Bach was quite helpful with that. So let's look at what we all know as how the right and left brain functions. The left side, um, which you can Google this, but many of us have learned this somewhere along the way and remember it, is the analytic side. The left side does accounting. It's the verbal side. It's the sequential side. It's the numerical side. It's logical. Think of Spock. He's a left brain guy in uh, Star Trek. It's a scientific mathematical side. Again, as um, I said before, music and math at a very high level are right brain. But when you're just learning what you learned in calculus and algebra and times tables, that is left brain. Language, people who have an ability to speak six languages, they're very left brain. Reasoning, logic, written word, all of that is left brain. And think about all those things I said, those are all parts of everyday American life. Numbers, sequence, logic, what are you gonna do? Step one, step two, you know, even people that work in situations where you have to measure your productivity, it's all percentage, you know, how much of the percent of the time are you doing this and this? And, and even doctors and pharmacists particularly, you're constantly measuring and counting all day long. You hardly get a break from that sort of thing. And then the right side of the brain is the visual side, the spatial side, the perceptual side, and it's the creative sides of our brains. It's the intuitive side, it's the facial recognition side, because when you see a face, and this was a problem for HM, actually, when you see a face, it's a whole response. You don't say, oh, his eyes are this far apart and, you know, his eyebrows are this high from his eyes or, you know, he has this overlap in his teeth. That's how I'll recognize him. No, it's the whole picture when you do facial recognition. And that's on the right side of the brain. 
The arts usually are on the right side of the brain. Imagination, insight, which is why Jill Bolte Taylor named her book My Stroke of Insight, because insight is a right brain function. Uh, Three-dimensional forms. I mean, the people that invented three-dimensional printers, they have got to have a lot of right brain going on to be able to imagine something that can create something that comes out three-dimensionally. And holistic thought is from the right side of the brain. Again, that's from the idea of facial recognition, seeing the thing as a whole. So as I was talking about when I, some of the aspects I look at when I'm doing an evaluation on a dog that I'm going to be working with, you know, those are all little parts, but you're still looking at the whole picture. And I broke it down into little parts so that someone else can understand how to look at these different things to learn to engage their right brain and look at the whole picture. And, you know, so often we do that, but then we dismiss what we perceive. You know, you see a person walking a dog a certain way, and you immediately think that they're going to have this, this, and this problem. And that may not be the case because you're missing the whole picture of their relationship to each other. And maybe there's things going on that you're not aware of with the dog or the person structurally. So the whole picture is a really important part of being able to be good in any medical field, um, certainly in any kind of sports. And, you know, sports is, again, like music and math. You've got to learn those routines, the running, the turning, the coming back and forth. And what makes somebody an elegant, beautiful runner ultimately is when they don't need that kind of logical thought anymore and they graduate to running on the right side of the brain and they're just, you know, their body has learned a certain way to move and it's thoughtless and they are able to fly. Like again, Hussein Bolt, <laughs> interesting that he has the same name as Jill Bolte Taylor, but he is really a magical runner. Watch some of the old Olympic footage of him. I mean, he's just running in a way that is unlike anyone else and he's tall, but he's really, the way he runs is mechanically amazing. So what does this all have to do with T-Touch? In the world of animals, as you know, I talked about how we have um, a much smaller corpus callosum in animals so that they are not as connected from the right and left side. And we have, well, where is my picture? I have an illustration here somewhere. Here it is. One of the things that Linda... Um, was lucky to do early on in her career developing T-Touch. And she worked with this woman, Anna Wise, who wrote this wonderful book, The High Performance Mind. And Anna Wise um, was really interested in the work of a British man named Maxwell Cade. And Maxwell Cade, at C-A-D-E, was interested in the awakened mind state. And he was putting... Um, a something called a biofeedback machine with electrodes on both sides of the brain of high-level meditators and yogis. And he was finding that the brainwave patterns for them when they were in this awakened mind state were quite specific. And what Anna Wise found doing a similar study with Linda, some of her students, and some horses in Colorado at the Biofeedback Institute in Boulder many years ago was a similar brainwave state as what we had in the awakened mind state with these deep meditators. And what that is, is a superior connection between the right and left brain. And in fact, Linda has had many people um, do biofeedback work with her, and they have all stated that they have never seen anyone um, or measured anyone with such a strong connection between their right and left brain. And this is an amazing ability to develop, and T-Touch seems to develop that ability. The people that have done T-Touch a long time, like me and some of the other people in the group, have also gotten to a place where our right and left brain are deeply connected, which I've got to tell you is very useful. If you ever hurt yourself and you have one side that's not working, it's really great to have the other side ready to go. And part of this is, you know, you're using both sides of your body to do this work. We're leading the horses on the offside a lot of the time early on when we were especially only working with horses. And that really engages the right side of your brain in a way that, you know, nothing else that most people do in their daily life does unless you happen to draw or do music in your spare time. So I'll show you this picture and then I'll talk about it. We have um, 
this and Linda has criticized me a bit because this these uh, bands here in the middle are not exactly how they appeared. They're, uh, some are a little shorter, some are a little longer. But the important thing with this picture is that the awakened mind state has the same amount of brain wave, one side to the left, one side to the right, on both sides of the brain in these specific areas of brain waves, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, you know, even in horses who we think don't necessarily have good logical thinking, you know, the left and right brain are engaged equally in this pattern. And how we measured this was when the horses were in the corner of the labyrinth having circular T-touches on them. This is the pattern we saw. So what that was measuring were the different brain waves. And of course, as you know, people have heard of the REM sleep, which is delta brain waves. Those are the deep sleep ones. And then we have um, our beta brain waves, which is our daily magic uh, math and logical thinking uh, parts of our brain waves. And then the alpha brain waves are what we use to have relaxation. And the theta brain waves, which are a little bit deeper, are what we need for recall and retention. Now, this was interesting to me as someone who had been a little traumatized, like many people, by uh, a really angry calculus teacher in high school who thought we were all stupid. And so I was always on edge. Please don't call on me. I didn't get that problem right. I don't know if I did it right. And when you are not in relaxation, you have a hard time learning. And so is my recall on calculus very great today? No. But I'm good at algebra because my algebra teacher was very relaxed. He just assumed we'd all get it if we kept explaining it a hundred times. And he didn't have a personal investment in our lack of skills. And so he was a very different kind of teacher because I found going to his class a little bit like dreaming. And part of that was I was engaging the right side of my brain. So algebra, really strong. Calculus, got to really think about it. And so here we have that picture again. The first line is the beta brain waves, which we need for logic. The next line is the alpha brain waves, which we need for relaxation and optimal learning. And then if you're learning in the theta brain wave pattern, that's what you need for recall and retention. And that is a more relaxed state yet. So, you know, similarly in physical therapy school, when I was learning cardiology, we had a really demanding teacher that made you feel embarrassed when you didn't know something and we were not in this pattern. So that was something really hard for me to relearn for the physical therapy practitioner exam. And my friend and I knew about this because I talked about this in several topics of research in PT school. And so we put ourselves in a relaxed state with nice Bach music to listen to and retaught ourselves cardiology. And both my friend and I, she was not even as strong in that field as I was, got nearly a 100 on the exam. I think I got one question wrong in cardiology. So being relaxed is really important for learning. And people don't think about that. And then the last one was the delta brainwave. And this is the one that you have in deep sleep. And that's really relaxed. So when these horses and people were in the corner of the labyrinth doing or receiving circular T-touches, this is the pattern we saw, the awakened mind state. And that was the same pattern that Maxwell Cade had measured in yogis and swamis and really trained high-level meditators. And this is, you know, we revere people who are able to to meditate like that because they can do things like make their body lift up and you know amazing things that really trained yogis and meditators can do and who would ever dream that a horse standing in a labyrinth you know and that's the little um, uh, right angle turn maze that we use in T-Touch I will be able to show you a live one out in the yard sometime soon and then I have this little one in my mini book um, here's the labyrinth down in this corner. So when the horse was in the corner of the labyrinth where this little sticky dog is, and we were doing those circular T-touches, we were able to measure that pattern that I showed you. And this is important because we need to be in that pattern for learning. And so for those horses standing in the corner of the labyrinth, they were learning in a new way. And Linda tells a story about a particular mare, and they hadn't measured, I believe it was alpha brainwaves in her all, all the week that they were doing this. And as they were talking about it on the last day and holding her, and they had the mind mirror on her, the biofeedback machine, 
and they said something like, well, we haven't been able to measure the alpha brainwaves in Hara this week. It seems like that's just not what she's doing. Immediately, we saw alpha brainwaves on the biofeedback machine. And then they said, well, that's great, but there hasn't been theta. Immediately, theta appeared. It was as if the horse was able to not only understand what they were saying, but control her body enough to have that happen. And I think that part of what that happened, uh, why that happens, is from something called heart coherence, which we'll talk about later. But Linda was holding the horse, and this is significant because Linda is very good at um, focusing her intention. And so as she's holding that horse and imagining theta brain waves briefly while someone's talking or she's talking, that is translated right through that lead line into the horse, and the horse is able to perceive that you know, if not in the logical left part of their brain, in the right side of their brain where they're feeling intuition, insight. And so this is a remarkable study. And now um, biofeedback machinery is a little easier to come by. And we have a woman named Robin Bernhard down outside of Virginia, I believe, Maryland, DC area. And she has been working with uh, a few T-Touch practitioners and replicated this study and others. Um, and has really delineated, you know, is it one stroke with the wand? How many circles do you have to do to see this? And it really is surprising how little you have to do with T-Touch to get this result. Now, I, as a craniosacral therapist, am fascinated by this because we have not yet measured um, a person doing craniosacral therapy to see if this is the same brain pattern that we get. And I really should take a few people that I know well who have been doing cranial work for a long time down to Robin and see if we can do a little study and see what happens to the person on the table and the person doing the work. Because there are so many similarities between T-touch and craniosacral therapy. And I, one of the things I researched um, in sort of a fun way, not like serious research, was um, seeing what happens to the craniosacral rhythm when you're doing T-touches. And in fact, there's a thing called a still point where the craniosacral rhythm comes to a spontaneous stop. It's a moment of deep healing. And again, doing the circular T-touches in particular cause the craniosacral rhythm to come to a stop. And I know myself, when I have been in a very deep meditative state doing yoga, I can feel in my own body my cranial rhythm stop. So it is very likely that we're going to see this same brainwave pattern in someone possibly doing and receiving craniosacral therapy. So that's something that we have to look forward to exploring later on when I'm even older. <laughs> and this is important because this shows us in a way that animals have the capacity to learn. And it's, you know, it's not like we taught them something and they had to repeat it. Temple Grandin's, um, one of her books, is so great at describing the many flaws in the research studies that they have done to prove or disprove animal intelligence. And in fact, they have tried to get children to do some of the studies they tried to get animals to do, and the animals were actually more successful than the children. So we are so limited by what we think an animal can or can't do in our development of these studies that we're, it's impossible for us to measure how intelligent they are or even ourselves. We're not so good at that either. So um, when you're working with your animals, just remember that you need to teach them things on both sides and yourself. So when you're practicing the T-touches that we talked about for many episodes of Conversations with a Corgi, make sure you use your left hand and your right hand. And if you are a person who had a stroke, it is really important to try to use your right and your left hand. And I'm really curious myself. I know sometimes when I've been um, having a, like a serious migraine headache when I've been at T-Touch classes, working on a horse using my left hand, because my headaches are usually on the left. But anyway, I have been able to make myself feel better. And I I, again, think it's because you're getting that brain balance. I think so much of brain dysfunction in our world is from a lack of brain balance. So give yourself a treat today. You know, pick up an instrument and just try to play it. That's going to engage your right brain. Try to draw something upside down. Try to write with your opposite hand of what you normally write with. You know, find a piano and just see if you can play something. And in my own experience as a musician, I'm a very left brain person with music and I wasn't doing T-Touch 
a lot during the time I was learning music. And so I learned classical music and I did it with step one, step two, step three. I was really, you know, you're counting in music and some people just have that rhythm innately in their body and they don't need to count out tapping their foot loudly, one, two, three, four. Some people just feel the rhythm and they don't have to, you know, literally think of the numbers when they're doing it. And I'm not one of those people. And so what happened with me, I was uh, playing in some bands and orchestras at the boarding school where I was working. And they wanted a flute player in the jazz ensemble. And one of my really good English students was the jazz pianist in that group. And he asked me if I would come and play with them. And you know, if you've ever read jazz music, there's like four notes and some rhythm there. It's not, it doesn't look anything like Baroque music. Um, because so much of jazz is feel, and it's not a musical uh, genre that I'm a big fan of anyway. But boy, there was weeks of them saying, Sally, just let go, just play. And I, I just, I had such a hard time doing it. And the kid would play a few things on the piano for me, and I would try to play it back in my own way. I have a bad ear too, so I wasn't really in key. But one night I came in there, I was full of emotion. All kinds of things were just exploding in my life. And I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to pour the emotion I have into this music that I'm going to play. And it came my time for the solo because in jazz you each take turns and you have like your solo for each instrument and then you come back to that original form and play that a little bit as a group and then the next person takes their turn. And, you know, so in that way jazz has a structure, but then you've got this free form stuff in between. My turn to play. I don't know what I played. I mean, I was doing tones that you do with overblowing that you see a lot of people do in jazz and things. And I mean, I went on somehow. I wasn't counting. I didn't know where I was in terms of coming back. We each had like a few measures and it just worked perfectly. And I came to the end where I had to take a breath and they all came back in and it ended my little time playing by myself perfectly. And when we were done our song, the whole group gave me a standing ovation. I mean, all these boarding school kids, but, and the director, they were like, Sally, that's what we were trying to tell you to do all along. And it was just taking that right brain part of myself, the intense emotions I was experiencing and letting go of all the rules and just playing. And that was still is really hard for me with the flute. And a lot of people have said, if that's how you are with one instrument, you should learn another instrument and don't take lessons and don't learn it. Like let teach yourself. And the saxophone has the same fingerings, and I have often thought maybe I should try that. But instead, I have a harp and a piano now to practice with. So I really encourage you. It's going to change your relationship with your animal. And read the works of Temple Grandin, because uh, some of her early books really talk a lot about the faultiness in our research studies about animal learning. And part of what we know from T-Touch is that our animals do learn. They learn new ways to be. We see animals that have had T-Touch work to able to take a breath and not react, but think and respond. And that is an incredible part of this work. Um, and it's partially explained by this phenomenon where the brain is engaged. And again, that book um, is Anna Wise's book, uh, High Performance Mind, Mastering the Brain Ways for Insight, Healing, and Creativity. It's a really incredible read. Um, I think she's passed away now. And also check out the TED Talk with um, Bolte Taylor, My Stroke of Insight. And also check out Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, the, her workbook, which is now available um, widely. I think it was the second edition where they had a workbook. That's another fun thing to have just to work with your right brain and try to give yourself a break, especially if you work in some kind of a field where you're engaged in logic all of the time. It's a really good idea to try to use your right brain and you just don't know what kinds of things will occur to you when you're in your right brain. It is a real gift that we have the two sides and it is an amazing thing that when you have a stroke, people are able to learn everything on the other side of their body most of the time. So think about these things and we'll continue on with conversations with a corgi tomorrow with a new topic. And we have a special fun day planned for Sunday. And this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T-Touch practitioner, and Tristan Corgi, who's sleeping. He's using his right brain this morning. <laughs> and we will see you again tomorrow. Thanks so much for joining us.